put in the referral so that I could um, just kind of get work done and feel better. And after, right after my first session, I could just tell the difference and that was what I, where I needed to be. And, and just to, sorry, to back up a little bit. So um, I do work part-time, but I'm mostly a trophy wife. It, it is very expensive to live where we are in rural Alaska. So I'm very fortunate that my husband can provide for us, that um, I can be a stay-at-home mom to our son. And I do have just a part-time job that I maybe put 10 hours in at, at a week. But um, I'll go ahead and I think hand it off to the next person. Or is it? Oh, no, it's still on me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so what I would like to also talk to you all about is that um, where I live in my experience with the healthcare that I receive is that I'm often spoken to and I have to kind of work to have a provider engage with me, specifically um, a doctor. And that can kind of be met with a little bit of sorry, I'm I'm, bl I'm blanking on it, but it it's not the way it should be. Um, however, when I get to go to tribal healing. I have pretty much a 180 experience of that. There's a lot of discussion. It's a safe space to help me process my emotions and my stress. Um, so we do she really the takes the time to explain what she's doing with with me and what 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 is going to help me. And and also like I also have to say that I do experience that with 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 the other folks who I see regularly as well, such as my physical therapist and my chiropractor. But this has been a, a, a bit of a bit of a struggle. So I'm, I am very grateful that I get to talk to, to pre-med students about this, having more of a discussion with your patients and to letting them know what their options are so that you can have them take an active role in their own health care. Um, and so with tribal healing back in 2019, um, I have actually run two half marathons and I didn't properly train for my second half marathon. And it got to kind of, I could really tell my legs that I was running and they were no longer helping me deal with the stress, but actually hurting my legs were aching. So I went and saw the tribal healer and she actually had me take a break from running for about seven months, which is, which is a long time for me. Um, and after her being able to fix them, it was so nice to be able to go on a run again and have my time, my time for me to kind of just let go, which is um, a great deal of what our conversations are with tribal healing and the chiropractor and physical therapy about better managing stress. And so um, it really my emotions really play out in my body um, that the, the stress that I carry is literally on my arms, my, 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 my gut kind of twisting around with my emotions. Um, these are all things that we, we kind of talk about letting go of uh, and, and that, that is kind of detrimental to my health and all of them really talk to me about kind of doing things differently and give me a sense of empathy and compassion. And I feel really, really fortunate. And I believe that's everything I have to share with you all. Thank you. Brianna, I'm going to teach Anna. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you, Anna. And I'm looking forward to um, this next section and I'll share screen and then I'll do some introductions. Okay, we should be ready to go. <laughs> All right. 
uh, thank you everyone for, thank you everybody for having me here today. I have a, I was gonna use my river voice, but uh, they wanted me to use a microphone. It might not be so loud. <laughs> um, here we go. Let ka fina me to do it. You cut do a sock, shing it clean up, sit tin up. You cut do a sock, nanyaina, hatsiti, kachadi yeti, hatsiti staki and quan. I a hat. My English name is me to do it. My thinking names are sit tin up and katu klaat. And I I am shing it. My family comes from Wrangell and Yakata area. Um, I'm really thankful to be here to present with Anna. I've actually known Anna. Um, just as a friend for many years, and our paths have crossed over, um, you know, plants as food and medicine and community health and wellness. And so it's fun to be able to present at the same time as her. Um, I also, in the story, you know, Alaska is the biggest state, but the smallest community, right? Um, I had worked for Arctic Chiropractic out in the Valley under Dr. Engelbrook for many years, providing traditional healing services. So when I heard that the Arctic chiropractic doctor up there was working collaboratively in this process, I was like, well, of course, it's part of their ethos. Um, so it was a lot of fun. And I've worked with the Norton Sound Health Corporation, um, helping to facilitate communication between their traditional healers and their administration. So even though I didn't personally provide services to Anna, I feel very comfortable being in this space and talking about these things. Um, one of the things that I, you know, come to speak to you about as a traditional healer is the, um, let's go back here, is that education and Western medicine is not separate from. Um, traditionally, healers, when they did their work, they did a lot of research and development, and also knowledge was actually a trade item between medicine people. So the best way to work on a body part or the best herbs to work on an illness, uh, some of the medicine people, even though it happened very rapidly in our state, when we had the influx of the epidemics, such as smallpox or TB or influenza, there were pockets of medicine people who found out how to treat those illnesses with traditional uh, plant medicines and other um, remedies. The problem is, is it moved so fast, it moved quicker than we could communicate at the time. And so we, you know, you know lost whole communities. So when we're talking about uh, traditional healing, you know, there's different classifications. It's like saying doctor. Oh, you're a doctor. Are you a doctor of psychology? Uh, a doctor of podiatry? A doctor of mathematics, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's this overarching term. And so within this uh, process of a uh, career or, um, you know, this term of traditional healing, you have different groups of people and it's broken down in, in two cultural contexts here. One is from Wilson Justin, who's Nebesna uh, Atna Athabaskan from the Chistachina area. And that was put in as a, um, definition for the doorway to a sacred place for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. And then the second one is a, a more Clinket or Southeast version of uh, the classifications. And so you have a tribal doctor, which is somebody who works with individuals and their actual gift or what they focus on can be very different from tribal doctor to tribal doctor. Some of them focus on body work, some on energy work, some on talk therapy. Um, some on ceremony, some on plant medicines, and then there's some that have the broad spectrum of capacity. And uh, in here, you see funny words like sorcerer, which um, that's just because English is a weird language to translate into. And so, um, you know, you don't, we don't want to give power to those things by calling them their traditional names. So we just kind of use the goofy Western names because it de- stigmatizes it or it takes away that negative charge or fear that might be associated with it. Um, the term shaman, I think needs to be clarified here. I'm not gonna read everything in here. I always provide a lot of context in my slides so you can take it away later. 
cite it, read it, digest it. Um, but the takeaway is shaman is actually a word that comes from uh, the Yakutian area and, you know, Ibenki area or that language. And it means their medicine person. It has a very specific cultural context. So here in Alaska, we have different words for our practitioners. So like a, a, a medicine person um, that they would call shaman here would actually be an icht. And that level of, oh, let's see here if we can get this smaller so you can see the screens. There we go. Um, so that level of practitionership would actually be somebody who was an intermediary between the human realm, spiritual realm, and the natural realm. And they um, utilized the worldview to interact with those different spaces. And they were able to um, anticipate when things would go out of balance in a community or in relationship to um, the salmon run right, and figure out how we could fix our behavior to be better relatives for those things. So that's what an if or up where Anna's uh, uh, would be doing, right? So at the level that we're talking about, we're talking about traditional healers. And so a, a ethno herbalist would be a uh, Kayani um, Nakani, which is, it sounds funny because they sound similar, but that would be like the um, spokesperson or the beloved uh, uncle who speaks with the plants, right? Or auntie in this case. Clinket uh, in most of our Alaska native languages are um, non-gendered pronouns. So um, unless it's specified, then it's a, it's a non-gendered pronoun. So the gift is something that was identified pretty early on uh, in this practitionership. Most people who are in this work are actually born with gifts or predispositions. It's also, you know, we see similar in Western contexts, right? There's little kids who like, I want to be a doctor when I grow up, or I love teeth, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> which my son's girlfriend, she's like, it's her life goal to be a dentist. Um, so it's that, that similar context, right? We have children who are identified very young. They're then cultivated by the community and taught how to engage with those gifts and they provide mentorship and education so they can perform those gifts. Um, and so the traditional healer doesn't own the gifts or spiritual power that they use to conduct healing. They consider themselves only a conduit for healing for the energy to flow through the act of being a conduit lends to a much longer discussion on ethics of healing and the responsibility of the healer to be healthy. However, the short of it is the healer does not uh, do the necessary interpersonal work, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, or spiritually. Um, the imbalances can transfer. And again, that's a much longer conversation, but that just speaks to the ethics of the healing perfection or profession, excuse me not perfection. That would be the opposite because <laughs> nobody is perfect. That would be the balancer. It's that expectation of perfection and that's not reality, right? Many of our traditional healers that we have today actually have significant stories of adverse experiences that they are now in service to because they want to remedy those social ills or uh, relational ills that cause the experience that they had. So it's like that charge to um, engage in a way that they can fix our broken structures as well as our people. Um, if you find with behavioral health, if you look at adverse childhood effects, our behavioral health providers uh, across the board actually have high ACEs as well. It's because we see something that was an injustice and we want to do our best to correct that so other people don't have to get, have that experience. Um, so the classifications of traditional healers that we're working with here are the traditional or tribal doctor who works at a clinic, whether it's Manila, Norton Sound, Kanaitse, South Central Foundation, right? They are certified to work in a clinic and they're taught the, the Cerner programming and the HIPAA information and so forth. Traditional healers is a large class of people, whether they're operating in a clinical setting or if they're operating word of mouth from their homes. 
uh, which is very common. And there's a lot of traditional healers who actually don't want to engage in the medical system because they will then be um, prohibited from doing their work in, a, in the way that they need to do it. Um, so that's one of these reasons why we need to have these partnerships, right, for that freedom. Um, and then we have, uh, well, that's the, basically the two, right? And so they both have extensive experience, uh, extensive training and teaching, or I mean, treating patients, excuse me, and they're recognized or certified by elders, by the tribe, by the tribal health consortium or the tribal health corporation. Um, and so when we're working within this, the domains change. It's just not the physical, mental, and emotional. The domains that they work in that are uh, compatible with the worldviews around the state. And again, we're not all the same, but we're similar. Uh, is the spiritual realm, mental realm, emotional realm, physical realm, and relational realm. So if you just code switch from behavioral to relational, people are like, oh, that's a positive or negative behavior. What we do is, oh, the person's relationship with their stress is out of balance. So we need to work with that. Or the person's relationship with nutrients and food and being able to nourish themselves is out of balance. That's what we need to work with. So that code switches to the relational health. Um, these are the different kinds of domains that you'll see. I mentioned a few, right? Indigenous research, that's actually a traditional, uh, original education is based on indigenous research methodology now that shared with you that comes from a traditional context. Of course, our traditional nutrition, our plants as food and medicine, um, our game meats, our fish, all of those things are important. We also have the medicinal practices, energy work, body work, language in itself is healing because it's tied to the relationship with the land and there's science that's embedded in our language. Uh, storytelling is an incredible and powerful uh, form of healing. Then there's also the ethics in understanding relationship and protocols and boundaries, rites of passage, traditional counseling, song, dance, and drumming, environmental health, world healing traditions, biomedical in interface and HIPAA, first aid and CPR, and ceremony and detoxification. Um, so to say all of that, right, we have this inclusivity of spirituality. All things have spirit, right? Uh, all spirit deserves to be respected. And so when you start thinking in that way, that relational aspect actually takes on a much stronger role. Um, and it's some of the core tenets. So adaptations, they're the adaptation and uptake of Western medicine, when we say traditional, some people think of it as stuck in the past. When we say that, part of that understanding is adaptate, four minutes, perfect. Adaptation is part of our traditional culture, right? Knowledge sharing and intellectual property is part of our traditional culture. So for me to even become an entry level traditional healer and do the work that I do, um, I didn't throw a lot of my credentials out at first. I have, I'm an alumni of UAA and APU. I have uh, several associate degrees, bachelor degree, master's degree, and I work in law and policy and education as well as um, treating people. And for me, I had the education from my grandparents. I had the education from culture. I had education from learning the hard way, school of hard knocks. Um, that's all sorts of stories there. Um, but also within the collegiate system, for me to start getting a foundational knowledge of what I needed, I have over 200 credits now. And I'm just through my master's. So I had most of the Bachelor of Science of Nursing. I have Human Services, Alaska Native Studies. I have... Um, you know, over at APU, a bachelor's in arts and, you know, rites of passage. My master's was on traditional healing certification program development. And so now after 20 years and almost 200, about 200 credits, I'm now considered a, a professional. I'm not even a, a master or grand, you know, mama. 
I'm just, <laughs> they're like, okay, you can talk. <laughs> um, so what can we do and what can't we do as, as healers, right? We cannot force people to heal. That's like the first rule of healing. And you will find that out as professionals as well. Uh, all we can do is um, support the community or the person in the process of acknowledging their feelings, providing education, holding space for processing emotions, assisting with identifying solutions, and providing support in acting on those solutions. So we help people who want to choose or who are on the process of healing themselves. So tech, we're just tech support, right? Um, and I think that when we bring Western and traditional together, we all benefit, we all win, especially our customer owners, our clients, or our um, patients. And so to tie this back in with Anna's story, you know, with all of that said, what she received may look like body work and tendon manipulation, which I have to say the um, people up in Norton Sound are masters in uh, changing the structure of the body by tendon manipulation. And they don't even do it hard. It's like so gentle. Um, but during that process, Anna also received talk therapy and storytelling to find out what was the actual root cause of why her body was out of alignment. And so that's the power of um, this situation is you have all these professionals working together and you have the person who can spend the time that many of you will not have when you're working to listen and get to those root causes. So thank you very much. And I will pass over this uh, presentation and we'll be around for question and answers later. Ganesh All right, our next panelist that's going to talk a little bit about their treatment, specifically working with Anna, is Chandra Praetor. And I'm going to try and find her here so I can pin the video. Where is she? There she is. All right. There. Chandra, you want to go ahead and get started? All right. So hi, I'm Chandra Prater. I'm a physical therapist up here in Nome with Norton Sound Health Corporation. And um, I've been lucky to be up here for eight years. And we have um, a great tribal healer team that we often consult with or refer patients back and forth. And, um, and so it's been very good. I... I haven't been anywhere else before where we've had such open referrals back and forth. Um, so a little bit about um, physical therapy and she also saw occupational therapy um, in our department and it did. And um, so just even working within our two different disciplines and addressing different impairments and functional um, limitations. So physical therapists and occupational therapists work in the world of movement. Our goal is to keep people in their mobility and their independence as much as possible. And with that, um, what they, the highest quality of life and within their lifestyle. So um, we really try to work on what we call patient-centered care and then also evidence-based care. So the evidence-based is the westernized like research, what ha works, but we don't want to lose the patient-centeredness in that trying to create the programs that we give patients or the exercises, or if we do other treatments is really what is going to maximize that patient's ability to return to their their lifestyle and their quality of life or to improve their independence. Um, so with Anna, one of our goals was definitely the running was she wanted to get back to the running. And so doing things that not only help 
um, keep her symptoms down, but can promote her, you know, changing up how intense things are. So for us, integrating um, different disciplines of providers into the plan is important because ultimately it's the patient that has to return to their activities. It doesn't really matter if they can run 10 miles if they don't want to, but they can't say sit kind of for 10 minutes. So for every patient, we try to develop a plan that is also within their um their interests and what they need to do, but also something that can be carried forward in their home life. We our goal is that patients shouldn't need to see us for their whole life. <laughs> like it's integrating what that program is. So finding exercises or an exercise program that they may already be doing, either like if they're they go to the gym or if they, you know, have a running program and something they can carry out long term and then they can come back if needed. And that's our goal. Um, so with Anna, it's easy to oh, just come in for a few sessions to maybe if something is not working. And regardless what the internet said, there's never one thing, especially one exercise that's going to fix everybody. And so if an exercise is not working, it's just looking, listening to the patient and you can probably find a different exercise to do the same thing, but that will work with their lifestyle. Um, and of course, then integrating what they can do with their family and if you need to family education. So having a young child, that's a lot of lifting. And I know when um, she was seeing occupational therapy, that was something that we, um, her occupational therapist had to consider as alternate ways to integrate um you know, you can't stop being a mom just because your arm hurts. So um, that's our goal within our department is using um, our our interdisciplinary team. And that includes tribal healers. Um, Sometimes, you know, if we need a different medication from the doctors working with them so that patients can return to their um, highest quality of life and stay independent as long as possible. So that's kind of just what I consider our role is within the healthcare system is specifically with like Anna's case. So, I mean, that's all I have right now. So I'll let, I get, I think Eric. Uh, yeah. is next. Thank you, Shanda. Dr. Ortman, you're up next. And I'm going to pin your video. And you should be ready to go. Just have to unmute yourself and you should be ready to go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, first off, I would like to welcome everybody into the, uh, the panel today. Uh, such a wonderful thing that's going on. Uh, thank you to the presenters. Uh, Gloria, thank you. And uh, Spencer, so I appreciate everybody being here. A uh, little bit about myself. I'm Dr. Eric Ortman. I'm a chiropractor up in here in Nome. Uh, I've been up here five years. I'm, I've been gratefully blessed to be able to to come to Nome and be a part of the community up here. And and if you haven't been part of the uh, village community, you you don't know. But if you have been, village uh, community is a huge part of uh, life in the in, up here. Uh, and anywhere in Alaska. Uh, so I'm grateful that I've been able to be a part of that. And part of that is uh, patient care. Uh, Anna came to me. Uh, my role as, uh, in Anna's healthcare is that of the chiropractor. Uh, I, Anna came to me back in uh, uh, 2021, November of 2021. She had seen a chiropractor uh, prior to me. Uh, I, I, like I said, I've been up here since 20, 2018 and uh, moved up from Minneapolis, Minnesota and from Iowa. And, and when Anna came to me, uh, my initial role was to identify what her her issues were, what what drove her, what motivated her to seek care. Uh, and I quickly learned that she was a runner and she wanted to get back to running. Uh, initially, her upper back hurt, but uh, through 
time. I've seen Anna. Uh, I've been uh, blessed to be able to see her 20 times since 2021, and I see her on a pretty continual basis. So uh, initially, uh, I, I found out that she was a runner, and I'm a runner too. I've been a weightlifter and a runner my whole life. I've run marathons and and half marathons, and and. I I love when anybody comes to me that's a high uh, a high endurance athlete. Uh, those are those are really fun to uh, uh, patients to deal with, and and uh, so I got the pleasure of being able to treat her initially in uh, 2021. Uh, of course, the first thing I do as a chiropractor, I bring the patient in. I, I get a uh, I do an intake on the patient. I do a history, and that gets my subjective with that patient. And in Anna's case, we determined it was upper back at the time. Uh, and throughout time, she's had uh, various other complaints uh, uh, that she presents with. So and you'll find that with your patients when you get into practice, you'll find that uh, patients come to you and they have, they might come with one complaint, but there might be other things that are going on and you just have to uh, be adaptive and, and uh, you know, treat the patient as they need treated. So, uh, and then of course I did an exam, uh, which gives me my, my objective and my assessment and my planned procedure with Anna in this case. Uh, Anna's care essentially uh, from me is that as a, chiropractor uh, is chiropractic. I adjust Anna. Uh, every time she comes in, I adjust her. Um, she gets relief from that. Uh, when we when we see her, it's usually um, uh, adjustment of the spinal column. There are times where I've adjusted the extremities. She might have pain in her hands or her, her knees or her hips or wherever, and we adjust that uh, accordingly uh, uh, through our, our, uh, our visit. So, uh, and of course, the chiropractic adjustment removes the nerve interference uh, that might be stemming from nerve root. Uh, as you'll learn in your studies. So um, uh, obviously that uh, are the things that hinder or might hamper Anna and what she likes to do. So that uh, the, the ultimate goal is to, to allow her to live her best life possible. And I think Chandra uh, hit on that. Uh, that's really what we want. We want the patient to be able to feel the best, do the things they want to do and return to a life uh, uh, that they, they desire. So the, we know that is homeostasis. Uh, we know that that's probably not, you know, and homeostasis. 100% is the day we're born, but uh, gravity acts on all of us. And, and ultimately we have to uh, address issues that the patient has. And then uh, Additionally, I treat Anna with interferential uh, uh, stimulation. Uh, it, everybody wants to call it TENS unit. It's not a TENS unit. It acts like a TENS unit. It kind of looks like a big TENS unit, but it's, uh, uh, it's a therapeutic modality that we use in chiropractic. Uh, it, it, we use pads, put pads directly on the skin. The, the, the impulse, the, the pulse per second of that pad sends an impulse up through the spinal column. The brain, uh, areas in the brain, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary uh, release a hormone. You know them, you've heard of them in Catholic lungs and endorphins. They get uh, released back down to the area that's being stimulated uh, or the aggravation, um, and, and that area then gets uh, uh, a dose of uh, endorphin or enkephalin based on however we're running the current. So, and then additionally, here recently, Anna's also sought, uh, we've we treated Anna with some manual therapy. So, and that helps prior to adjustment. It helps, just helps the patient uh, 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 adjust a little easier bottom line so you know and, and ultimately uh, any other adjunct therapies that I might see uh, ultrasound um, you know if I need to stretch or, or do anything like that I do but I try one of the things I try to do and I, and when you get into practice you'll see this I try to respect whatever the I you always know or have the presumption that this patient is probably being treated by somebody else so I try to respect the other uh, providers that when the patient comes into me and, and they say, hey, my PT one is doing this, I say, perfect, let's continue to let your PT do what they're doing and they do well, and we'll do what we do here. So I just try to keep that in mind and know that that patient is being treated by uh, somebody else. Finally, the continuance of Anna's care really ensures that she'll maintain uh, uh, homeostasis or as close to possible as she can. So she can go back to the things she loves. And ultimately, it's it's just one piece of Anna's healthcare, uh, and 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 it'll just allows her to live her best life possible. You know, you know, her continued care is really uh, 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 indicative, and she's very compliant with care. Uh, when she hurts, she gets in. 
uh, and sees me. So, but the main the main goal is ultimately what drives her. Going back to what I initially said, what drives her to seek care, and that's you know spending time with her husband and her her young son, uh, and her mom and dad, uh, and, and living the subsistence lifestyle that she lives here in Nome, which is allows her to thrive as we continue to treat her. Thank you. I'm getting better at this as I go. All right. All right. So now at this point in the program is when we're going to be turning things over to all of you. We're going to be breaking out into small groups. And that means that the folks on Zoom are going to be assigned to breakout rooms. If it so happens that you're in a breakout room without a facilitator, we just want to, we're doing our best. We just don't guarantee that everybody shows up that says they're going to show up. So please, if you are in a room without a facilitator, you can raise your hand. Um, you will make sure you get a copy of the facilitation questions. Um, and then we'll, we'll, someone's going to have to volunteer in that breakout session to, to help guide conversation for the folks that are online. If you're here in person, you should have on your tag the assignment of what room you're in on your name tag that you receive so you'll know where to go. Um, and we are going to have a person in each room that's going to be facilitating that small group discussion. The questions that we're going to go over are right here on this slide, the roles and disciplines of integrating traditional healing in Western healthcare practice and the perceived benefits of an interprofessional team. You see that Anna shared she has an interprofessional team and that benefit that it had to her. So you're going to be talking through that in your respective small groups. Um, in terms of time, everyone here in person. So first off, if you're on Zoom, you're going to have about a 10 minute break. Um, the breakout rooms are going to start at 12.10. So you'll have a little bit more than a 10 minute break. Uh, if you are here in person, that reason for that extra time is to go grab lunch. So you're going to grab lunch and then bring your lunch with you to your other breakout room. So you'll have it for the small group discussion. Any questions? And we will return back. This large group discussion is going to start here in this room at 1240. So then everybody returns to this space. People that are on Zoom, you'll hang tight. You'll return. You'll be returned to the main breakout room, the main session uh, for the start of the, the large group debrief. Thank you all. All right, welcome back everyone. If I can have your attention, I'm gonna get us started again for our large group debrief. I hope you all had plenty of time to talk with each other during our small groups. And then our panelists, if you wanna turn your cameras on, um, our GNOME-based panelists, I have you guys pinned so that we can see all of you now because I finally figured out by the last 20 minutes how to work the pinning, yeah. <laughs> All right. And then Dustin, just to make sure, are we still recording the large group? Okay, just double checking. Perfect. All right, so I first wanted to start with a debrief just to hear a little bit about what was talked about um, during your small group sessions. And to help guide us through that, I got a couple of questions. Was anyone exposed to a discipline at the event that you hadn't previously considered as having a role in this work of integrating traditional healing practices? from your small groups. And Dustin's gonna keep track of the chat box. So if anybody in chat would like to unmute and talk, they certainly can, or they can include their responses in the chat box and Dustin will be happy to read those for us. So anyone in the room? Go ahead, over there. Hmm. So I'm going to repeat that for everyone in here in case you weren't able to hear on Zoom. She said that there were some dental students within their group, and that was a real eye-opener of how those uh, that practiced in oral health care might include some traditional healing methods or referrals. And I, I told my group, we had a dental hygienist in our group too, and I said, Ellen, and she's my dental hygienist. If she's not there when I show up, man, I'm upset. Like I had such a good relationship with her. So building upon those personal relationships that you have with providers. 
Absolutely. Anybody else? I thought I saw another hand. Anybody on Zoom? Dental, multiple. Multiple <laughs> with dental. And it's it's oftentimes we don't think about oral health and how that's relevant and inclusive of a whole person healthcare, right? Holistic Some health. Some people, like Mita said, her her uh son's girlfriend, uh, just they grew up thinking they want to deal with teeth all day, every day, and that's their goal, right? In the back. I wish you had a mic because you said it so well, and I'm going to have to summarize it. But he he mentioned the the power of the gift of time that our dental providers have. They have time consistently, regularly scheduled to build those relationships and. It's really important for other providers to recognize and appreciate that gift of time that they have that others might not have. Well, yeah, go ahead, Nina, for sure. Right here in front stick. We have a lot of dental professionals, so you might like this plug. But in traditional healing, dental health is actually quite significant. As you know, there can be associated pain that then um, with the referral of pain can cause migraines, um, other issues. And not only that, but if you have infections in the mouth or in the roots of the teeth, it actually seeps into the body and it compromises the immune system. And so there's actually multiple levels that I could go into on why dental health and oral health care is so important. Now, pre-contact, we did not consume all the simple carbohydrates that we have now. And it's not just that they're in the mouth, it's in the bloodstream that also affects the teeth. And so the diet that we've been transitioned to has significantly affected the amount of cavities that we have, because if you ever saw Dr. Weston's price, his research pre-contact, well, not pre, but at contact, when he went out to communities with no store hub, it was all traditional foods. He said they had some of the best teeth he's ever seen in any human population. So how is that contrary to the narrative that we're told now about indigenous people or Alaska native people's teeth, right? So um, it it's very intertwined and, uh, you know, we had things like spruce pitch. You, the spruce pitch that's crystallized, you chew it with your teeth and you roll it, it turns into gum. It's also antimicrobial. So it's, of course, for me, it makes perfect sense. So I'm glad that you guys came up with that as well. Thanks, Nita. Excellent. So I'm going to move us into that next question about key takeaways. Anybody want to share some key takeaways that they had based on the small group discussion that they'll utilize in the future when practicing in their respective discipline? Um, I, moments. Go ahead. Um, as a dental hygienist, um, there are some limitations to how we can help our patient once they leave our clinic, especially with issues involving pain in the jaw. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to have resources and be able to um, give accurate and helpful referrals to all of our patients when we can't treat them in the clinic. Thank you. I don't know your name, but that was a really great contribution. I'm still navigating these pinning of the speakers, <laughs> but we do appreciate that. And actually, Nita has something she'd like to respond to that comment with. Yeah, sorry, guys. I didn't realize I, I knew so much about teeth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but also, so for dental hygienists and for practitioners, one of the things that's really common with people who've experienced trauma in their life is grinding of teeth, but also clinching of teeth. And if there's physical trauma or significant clinching, it causes micro fractures in the teeth that then expand. Mm -hmm. So traditional healers helping people to take care of themselves, one, but also helping them to navigate the stress that they experience will then help to mitigate that trauma to the teeth, especially the back teeth. Thank you, Mita. Any other takeaways? Go ahead. Um, one of the things that you talked about from something that you had said after this was about shifting 
like we talk about changing the language and different things like this development, but shifting from talking about behavior with patients to talking to them about their relationships with um different aspects of their life. And so we talked about in our small group, but that's definitely something that I'll take away from this uh, talk today because I just think it's such an amazing like change of perspective and way to open up conversations with patients um, and maybe like gain some insight and see what their relationship is with uh, traditional healing practices like prior to having come to your office. Excellent. So again, I'm going to try to be as eloquent as you were with this recap for the Zoom folks, um, but the importance of utilizing relational questions versus behavioral questions with patients, that it could com completely shift the outcome of that conversation and the level of information that is returned to the provider. <laughs> Excellent. Brianna, I see you on Zoom with a question. Or yeah. Comment. Go ahead. So I just wanted to, our group, our small group, we um, had a couple pre-med and some nutrition and some nursing people in there. And we all kind of talked about how um, one of our students said, nobody can do everything. So we have to really focus on relying on the other inner specialties to get the patient the care that they need and taking all of that demographic information, the cultural background and their belief system, and really integrating that all into the care of the patient rather than just using it for filing purposes. Yes. Thanks, Brianna. That's a really, really great point. I see someone else in the room and then I'll go back to some comments I'm seeing in the chat. Go ahead. In the back of the hat. I, I heard a couple of folks in, in my group talking about delayed patients. And I noticed that there are a couple of takeaways I got from that I found pretty helpful and that it's very difficult to motivate someone without like a stranger a patient who doesn't really know you without sounding like the only person talking to so we feel like you're talking to them. And so uh, another takeaway I got from that is um, we should use and build a lot of the patient's input and they'll be motivated to do Excellent. And just for recapping for everyone on Zoom, the importance of utilizing those relationships that a patient might have with a traditional healer to motivate compliance in practice and in treatment. Um, and that trust. And I think Anna said it, not feeling like you're being spoken at, but that you're part of the, dis the discussion, that you're working with the provider, not being talked at. Uh, some things from the chat, as a future nurse, I've learned that being able to meet a person where they are at with their culture and background centered, you're able to build a better relationship of respect and trust, which will help them get a better health outcome. Excellent. Thank you, Elise, for that comment. Anyone else in the room? Go ahead. With an amazing yellow blazer that I want. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Excellent. So she, she shared as a future pharmacist, she's going to be more cognizant of, of thinking about more natural medications and natural herbal medications instead of just only providing access to what we traditionally use in the field. Excellent. I love that. Can we do a happy dance? Yes, please. We love that in this room. Go ahead in the back. So there's something you said about learning culture and learning but it's also very important in our group, we talked about volunteering the people, right? Building that trust so that when that person comes in and comes to you as a professional, they already know you when they're volunteering. I love that. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Excellent. So this comment was about building trust through actually being present and participating in the community, not just being there only in the clinic, in the hospital, but being visible, being seen, participating, being a member of the community versus simply just being that person you see at the clinic or the person you see at the hospital. I love that. Thank you. Especially in small communities. Yes, especially in small communities. Um, and just to speak to that also is the mental health and well-being of the provider, especially in behavioral health scenarios, because you're trained not to have relationships with people outside of the clinic. 
when you are in a community of 300 people, that is absolutely not possible. And it lends to the providers themselves experiencing severe loneliness and depression. So I would say for Alaska, that relationship is primary to be a good provider, but also to take care of your own personal mental health. And in case for the Zoom folks, Mita just complimented and shared on that comment that in order for you as a provider in a small rural community to keep good care of yourself and avoid fatigue and practice good self-care, you have to really look at blurring the line between being confidentiality and kind of drawing this personal relationship line in the sand. You have to have good person and personal relationships in order to be trusted and take care of yourself. Otherwise, you sub suffer with loneliness and isolation, and it's going to be more likely that you're going to burn out as a provider in those small places. So it's a little different in Alaska. We hear that a lot, but you really have to be cognizant of it. Anyone else with some takeaways? Go ahead, Kristen. So in the course, there was a lot of great conversation about what they can do as professionals, but we backed it up a little bit to talk about professional education and training. Yeah. So in our group, we talked about um, Western, typical Western medicine in terms of uh, the doctor gets block by block by block. So I would like to ask, since um, the tribal doctors, do they actually get more time with their patients versus traditional Western doctor? And yes. the, qu the question here was whether a traditional doctor where they get, you know, the time blocks, you have this block with patient, this block with patient, if that's the same case for tribal healers or what that looks like for tribal healers as they practice? The, the short answer is yes. Um, most tribal doctors, and it depends on which clinic you're at, uh, changes the parameters of their scheduling. Um, however, they generally have anywhere from, you know, half an hour to up to three hours as needed to spend that time with people. Um, because one of the worst things to do is get people to open up and then kick them out the door. Um, now, because of the monetization of healthcare and time, there's a fine line and there's a lot of push from some of the institutions to reduce the amount of time that they have with clients. But the traditional healers themselves continually push back and say, you know, like, I see three clients a day. That's my practice. And that's how I maintain my ethical standards. Thank you. Thanks, Mita. Other questions for our panelists? Over here, Ella. Um, but in our group, um, a lot of people really wanted to find out how they just do more of the actual, like traditional practice, like what kind of herbs they use, like what does like storytelling therapy include? Is there places we can go to get more information about it that we can see more? So for the folks on Zoom, the question was whether or not there are places to learn more about the specific traditional practices. And I'm going to hand it off to Mita for that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and no. <laughs> um, you can find pieces of information and there are multiple different ways, you know, like Project Jukebox at UAF has lots of different conversations. There's conversations on YouTube with different traditional healers. There's um, different, you know, books that reference traditional healing, but there's very few traditional healer academics that are writing from that perspective. Um, and one of the reasons why I get the microphone is because I, am, I bridge that gap along with some fellow colleagues um, like Allison Kelleher and Tikhan Galbraith and Jennifer and Druli. Um, we all bridge those gaps in that space. Um, so one of the issues was colonization and assimilation made it um, dangerous to speak about traditional healers. They actually used to be targeted intentionally and either sent to penitentiaries, mental health institutions, or they just disappeared. Um, so it's only been within the last 20 some years that people can actually come out. Now we have some hardcore elders who stood in that space and took the fire, um, you know, like Della Keats and Rita Blumenstein and Karen Brooks, right? They all stood in that space and, and took that fire. Um, but now we can actually start coming out and speaking about it uh, because 
we don't have to live in fear that if I publish a book that I'm going to be, you know, missing off the coast of Alaska somewhere. Um, so it's just that process of, you know, having that space and funding because most of the grants didn't fund this kind of stuff. Mm, um, funding to do this, you'll see more and more um, access to documentation that you can use within your practice. Thanks, Mita. All right. We know we're at time. I just have one more question. This is the last one. Is there a shortage of traditional healers? Yes, exponentially. Exponentially, yes, is the answer coming from Nita on that thing on who she is. <laughs> All of our traditional healers are overbooked and booked out. When I was at the Arctic Chiropractic office with Dr. Inglebrook, the receptionists weren't paying attention and they literally booked me for eight hours a day, seven days a week for six months. Oh and God. I threw a fit. Um, and so from there, I decided because like native, non-native people, everybody wants access to this kind of care. So I went into the education and worked with ANTHC. And now I'm working in law and policy um, to uh, address this need. So we need a, a huge um, investment in workforce development to have enough traditional healers to even begin to meet the need. Thank you, Mita. All right, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists and all of you for being here today. I wanted to let you know that this is uh, the start of a conversation. I will make sure these slides get out. There was also a little QR code that you might've seen in the breakout rooms to get access to these links, but this has more some more information. Mita has shared these with you all so that you have some follow-up reading. And then finally, just wanna make sure everyone completes our evaluation survey. We really do look at these and they're important for us in our future planning. Um, I wanted to save the date for you all. We are going to be continuing this work in the spring semester. So there will be opportunities for simulation. We're going to be creating a traditional healing simulation that we will be running in interprofessional teams on select Fridays throughout the spring semester. So stay tuned for more information on that. We want to continue this conversation and keep um, making sure that this traditional healing is, has a space in your academic studies. Uh, so we appreciate your time today. Thank you to Chandra and Dr. Ortman, Anna, especially you. I know how hard it is to share your story and be willing to open up about yourself and what you're going through with your healthcare. So thank you for being willing to share that with all of us. And thank you to all of you for being here as well as our facilitators for their support. We appreciate you all and we'll see you soon.